Hello everyone. Today I am going to discuss with you a very important concept in stratigraphy which is known as the facies concept. This concept is important for everyone who is a student of geology to understand how the rocks have been formed, what are their environments, what are their characteristics and how they can be correlated. So let us begin. Time and again while studying sedimentology or stratigraphy, we come across this term known as facies. So what does facies mean? Facies is a word which is derived from a Latin word fascia, which refers to the external appearance, look, figure, aspect, conditions, situation of formation, etc. This word which was introduced by Nicholas Steno in 1669 got into wider uses after Emna's Grizzly's efforts in 1838. Later, the International Stratigraphic Guide, it defined facies as aspect, nature or manifestation of character of rock strata or specific constituents of rock strata, which means that the overall appearance of a rock or some parts of its constituents, how they were formed, how they look like, what is their composition, what is their geographical location, all these features which help the uh, rock to be studied, they will be included under facies. So facies is the sum total of all the physical, biological and chemical characteristics imparted to sedimentary rocks at the time of deposition. So for example, we have a fossiliferous uh, sedimentary rock or fossiliferous limestone. So the fossils which are the constituent of those rocks at the time that rock was being formed or deposited, then that will be the uh, type of facies. Similarly, if we have uh, a sandstone which consists of, you know, red beds, iron content in it. So that iron content which got included in that sedimentary bed of uh, sand, uh, it will become its facies. It will mark its facies because these are all very peculiar characteristics. Facies are the many different sediments resulting and resulting rocks that form at the same time but in different deposition environments. So it is quite possible that uh, facies may form at the same time but their deposition of formation may be different. So, on the basis of the differences in facies of various sorts in the uh, rock strata, there could be different types of facies and, and mind you, this list is not exhaustive. You can add several more facies and it's a qualitative term over here. So, we can use lithofacies, biofacies, mineralogic facies, marine facies, uh, freshwater facies, volcanic facies, boreal facies. So, each of this, say for example, lithofacies is on the basis of the characteristics of rocks. Biofacies on the organic content in the rocks. Mineralogic facies is uh, based on the mineral composition of the rock. Marine facies is that whether the sediments or the rock that has been formed is deposited in freshwater setting or marine setting. So, volcanic facies, is there any volcanic input in it? Boreal facies is the geographical location of uh, the sedimentary rock. So, once you are using this term facies, uh, you know, these uh, different types of facies, it is important to make clear the specific kind of facies to which the reference is made. So, in what context are you using this word uh, biofacies or lithofacies or mineralogic facies? Okay. Now, in the non formal uh, 
conversation or non formal usage non stratigraphers also promote the usage of terms like igneous facies metamorphic facies tectofacy seismic facies while paleontologists they have talked about biological facies and all okay so you will you will come across several of these terms time and again once you are studying stratigraphy but strictly speaking what is facies concept the facies concept applies to the appearance of a rock body the composition of actual nature of a rock body the rock body itself as identified by appearance of the composition and the environment recorded by a rock body so to summarize the facies is the sum of all the primary characteristics of sedimentary rocks now you can include n number of characters which you may assume that these are the primary characters so the different ways in which the facies may be identified is say uh, there are diagnostic features of each facies now if we call a lithofacies definitely the lithological character so there are several examples given over here then another special type of facies is the metamorphic facies uh, which you have studied in your uh, uh, semester 1 uh, during the metamorphic classes that they we have different types of metamorphic facies green schist facies amphibolite facies granulite facies so these are uh, dependent on the uh, formation of different rock types based on the pressure and temperature then biofacies the biological composition so the fossil content of any rock may help it to include get included in the biofacies then temporal facies these are the temporal sequences means time related in what time sequence have they formed structural facies they include of structural forms bioherms biostroms environmental facies so what are the environmental influences uh, what is the water depth what is the uh, uh, type of environment in which it is being formed so neritic facies abyssal facies uh, shelf facies okay then tectofacies where the tectonic control is the primary characteristic of the deposition of sediment that is called as tectofacies geographic facies so as i told previously on the basis of geographic occurrences means when the geographical location is the most important characteristic for a rock to be uh, defined so for example we are talking about the ice caps you know so when we talk about the ice caps we understand this that they are uh, the locations of poles so they mean the polar regime so when we say that the sediments being carried by the drifting ice or icebergs or we are talking about the typical uh, uh, po polar ice caps then it becomes important to specify the geographical locations because we understand that not every place on the earth has the polar ice caps or not every place on the earth has ice rafted debris so once we are talking about the a glacial generated sediments or glacially transported sediment then it becomes important to specify the geographical location i hope you understood how these things have been categorized now facies have been uh, differentiated primarily in three types the first one the type 1 2 3 the first one is differentiated primarily on the basis of appearance or composition without respect to their form boundaries or mutual relation so how does a rock look like or what minerals it is composed of not only mineral but what grains it is composed of we don't have to uh, consider the uh, where they are located what is their thickness how they have been related to other rock types may be termed as petrographic facies so we uh, as as the definition suggests that these are typical rock types where we have to only name the rocks say for example sandstone facies or argillaceous facies like that more or less characteristically heterogeneous you know the different facies they are not homogeneous because we are discussing only the rock type and stratigraphic continuity in this case uh, type 1 facies is 
considered unimportant and and is ignored so when we are talking about the sandstone facies or limestone facies or argillaceous facies it is not important to specify uh, which location which time or which environment they were formed so stratigraphic continuity in this case is largely ignored the type one is further divided into class a and class b class a is the facies which consists of all the rocks of certain kind without any reference to their form or occurrences so for example oolitic limestone facies black shale facies greywacke facies while the class b they consist of actual large bodies of indefinite form extent and mutual relation identified by generalized features of their composition or appearance that occur in certain areas and more or less restricted part of stratigraphic sections example red bed facies so you have to understand this by an example say for example we have uh, a sedimentary deposition which is largely you know argillaceous facies in a large area this will be uh, consisting of the argillaceous rocks which has in some restricted portions features like evaporite deposits or zeolites or red bed facies now we uh, we understand this fact that in a larger area it is not possible for evaporites to get deposited entirely over the sedimentary section so there will be specific locations or specific pin points where these uh, uni these unique characteristics like evaporites or red bed or zeolites uh, they will be located but uh, the class a say oolitic limestone facies so these are the limestone oolitic limestone large oolitic limestone deposits which may consist of certain typical characteristics so that will be the a class b so we can have a red bed facies in a uh, in a in a in a sandstone facies in a larger greywack facies the type 2 facies it consists of characteristic uh, composition differentiated on the basis of form nature of boundaries or mutual relationships so in the first case the form boundaries and mutual relations were not important but in the second case now the character the facies of characteristic composition which uh, are differentiated on the basis of form nature and boundaries so here now the mutual relationship between the different facies what is their form what is their boundary is important so the type 1 was petrographic facies the type 2 is the stratigraphic facies so petrographic facies type 1 and stratigraphic facies type 2 so these are all the stratigraphic bodies of one kind or the other and type 2 has been further divided into class c d and e so class c it is facies occurring in vertical succession whose boundaries are more or less horizontal stratigraphic planes with unspecified lateral relations so conventional stratigraphic units like formation stage zone all these are the different uh, facies types associated with class c the class d facies they are literally intergrading parts of some kind of stratigraphic facies and are separated at more or less arbitrary vertical cutoff planes now the class d facies are statistical mappable facies that have become important in various kind of facies analysis while the class c facies these are generally of strong contrasting characteristics whose lateral boundaries are irregular they intertwine and record shifting transgressive and regressive relationships so we can see here that in class d and e there is a change in the grade or the change in the uh, uh, sedimentary grain type and class e it is intertwining relationships where there is a, uh, a gradual change from one rock type to the other and the third type type 3 is associated exclusively with the environment of deposition okay so these are not material but are more closely related to biology sedimentology or tectonics so when we say that type 3 facies is not material here now we are not interested in knowing what type of rock types uh, or sediments may be deposited in different kind of environment but we are more specifically focused on the type of environment which may be used in stratigraphy and yes of course the environment analysis environmental analysis of 
great importance once we study the uh, uh, stratigraphy. All right. After having said that, let us look at a very important concept of Walder's law of facies. Time and again, this question has been asked in uh, various competitive examinations, and you all should know uh, the Walder's law of facies. It was given by Johannes Walder, and uh, Johannes Walder he defined facies as the sum of all the primary characteristics of a sedimentary rocks. Walder gave law of correlation. In its original form, the law of correlations may be defined as the various deposits of the same facies area and similarly, some of the rocks of different facies area are formed beside each other in space, though in cross section, we see them lying on the top of each other. So, to be defining it in more simple way, When we see the facies in a cross section, you know, like this, let us say we have three facies A, B, and C, and this is the cross section. In the cross section, we see that A, B, and C, they are lying over each other, they are lying on top of each other. But these facies, they had been formed not like this, not over one another, but rather side by side to each other. Like this. But in the cross section, you see them vertically stacked. So we can redefine it as the facies which we see overlying each other in a in a cross section were actually formed laterally adjacent to each other means that today in a vertical section when we see the facies lying on the top of each other but actually they were formed lying side by side to each other so only those facies or facies area can be superimposed primarily which can be observed beside each other at the present time so for example if you see here in this time rock unit A, when the sea level was A, there was one facies. Okay, let us name it as A. When the sea level rose, this is the rise in sea level, sea level B, then another facies came and it got deposited over this was the yellow facies, it came and got deposited over the uh, lower facies. Then when the sea level again rose, third second sea level rise then time c you can see that now a b and c they are lying over each other but rather what had happened so this was a somewhere here it was b and somewhere here it was c but due to the rise of sea level they came and got deposited over each other so if you take a core from this section you will find that there is a change in the grain size. So, from coarse, it has gone towards finding upward sequence. To understand this concept, it this diagram makes it, uh, you know, simple. But normally, students, what they do is they, they learn it, they remember it, but they don't understand why this happens. So, let us have a look at why does this happen. Let us imagine... And yes, of course, Walder's law can uh, Walder's law facies can best understood by using example of a marine transgression across a sloping shelf. So let us suppose that this is a setting, a sloping setting, in which uh, you know this is the shoreline. This is the sea level one. And let us call it as facies A. The facies A is you know, formed or deposited when the sea level is at 1. It is, and remember, I am not showing the entire basin. Okay. It is just the shelf part of it. So we have these one type of sediments. So this is the uh, setting. Now, this we can consider as the beach area 
Okay. The U static rise, the U static rise will lead to a rise in sea level. So sea level rises. Once the sea level rises, what will happen is that this sea level, as it goes up, it will now inundate, it will now inundate the landward portion, okay, the onshore portion. So now this shoreline one, shoreline one, it now will shift backward. This is shoreline two now. Why this has happened? This is this has happened because the rise in the sea level it has caused the water to climb up to to go back. So rise in the so this is the basin word area and this is the onshore area. So as the sea level rises, the water it goes back, you know, it inundates the onshore region. So now this becomes shoreline 2. So once the uh, shoreline moves backward towards the land, then this is called as the episode of marine transgression. Marine transgression. So once this happens, we see that there is an increase in the accommodation space. The sedimentary deposit uh, reposition, you know, may uh, it, it gets more space. So what will happen now that the sediments which were deposited on this, you know, uh, shallower portion. Now that shallower portion, the shallower portion of the sea in the first case, in the sea level one, has now shifted backward in sea level 2. So this portion, this portion now becomes what used to be this portion. Try to understand this. That once the sea level was at 1, this portion of the ocean floor or the uh, bathymetry, it has now shifted backward. So all these sediments, the one which are at facies A, will now start getting deposited here. While the deeper facies, deeper facies, which was this, you know, so in the case of sea level one, what you saw here that the white color limestone facies of or facies A was here, while the facies B was somewhere towards the basin, facies B. So this is the basin world. But now as the sea level has risen, so this was the sea level 1, now this is sea level 2. As the sea level 2 has come in the picture, so this was previously, this was previously shoreline 1, but now this has become shoreline 2. So, you can see here that facies A is now overlain by facies B. The facies A was this, which you see here. And this facies, this facies A, which was at sea level 1, has now been overlain by facies B because the rise in the sea level has given enough space for the uh, deposition of the facies, the, for the deposition of the sediments and the facies B has come to overlie the facies A. So in previous case, if we take a core, a, a vertical cross section from over here, over here. 
So this will look somewhat like this. So if I make a vertical section over here, then we will be having the, so this is the basement. This will be having, we'll be having the basement sediments followed by facies A. But in second case, if we take a core from the same location, now what will happen? We will get such kind of a setting. Base A and B like this. We are now understand that as we go from the shallower portion of the basin towards the deeper portion, the sediment size decreases. It The finer sediments are towards the deeper portion. So as we go from base towards top, we will get the coarsest sediments here and the finest sediments at the top. So this will be a normally graded beds or fining, fining upward sequence, fining upward, okay. Let's look at one more event of sea level rise. As the sea level rise now happens again, so this was sea level 1, sea level 2 and sea level 3. So here you see that this green color facies which is now facie C has come to lie over the top of facies B. So if we take a core again from the same location, now uh, this was this was shoreline one, this was shoreline two, and now. This is the shoreline 3. So we can see it is the typical case of marine transgression. So if we take a core from this region again, now we will get such type of a setting. So we'll be having the basement, we'll be having the facies A, facies B, facies C, and it will be again a finding upward sequence. So we saw here that in this case, in the first case at sea level 1, there were, we could see only one facies. It is not that other facies were not present, but those facies were lying side by side towards uh, beside A was B, beside B was C. As the sea level started to rise, now they have come to lie on the top of each other. So once they lie on the top of each other, now what will happen that if this was A, somewhere here was B and somewhere here was C. Now in case of the first sea level rise, when sea level 2, if the B came over here, in case of second sea level rise, C came over B which was already over A. That is how we get this vertical sequencing in case of the uh, uh, marine transgression. Facies uh, setting over here, let us have a look at the basin. So imagine that this is the shoreline, this is the shelf slope boundary and then this is the slope abyssal plane boundary. Now this portion which is the beach over here, this portion is represented by sands you know which may be cross bedded. Then the uh, shelf portion it may have silty sand followed by the slope region which has still finer sediments 
and then the abyssal plane which has only the fine mud so and uh, this is the sea level sea level if the sea level rises then if this is the sea level 2 then what will happen is that this shoreline will shift backward and the shelf sediments will now start getting deposited here the slope sediments will start somewhere from over here and similarly the abyssal plane will rise up so if we take a core from over here or from over here we will get such type of a setting coarser sediments followed by the finer sediments coarser sediments followed by finer sediments so this is a fining upward but in case of sea level drop so if the sea level now comes down sea level 3 so now this portion the same shoreline will now shift basinward and this entire portion which was under water will now become the beach so if this becomes the beach now what will happen is that all these sediments over here, over here, they will be overlain by the beach sediment. So what we will see, we will see that in the previous case, this was the situation where the coarser sediments were overlain by finer ones. And now what will happen again? We will have again the coarser sediments coming out at top. So now this becomes a reverse grading or uh, coarsening upward sequence. So I hope you understood this part that how the facies correlation may be done and how Walder's law of facies enacts. If you have any doubts, you can ask me.